and Sparviero, or Sparrowhawk. The Sparviero was one of the fastest bombers of its day. It also served as a highly effective torpedo bomber against enemy shipping. There was a difference in the Italian approach. Since Italy's shoreline stretched far into the Mediterranean, they did not see the need to develop the idea of deploying air power from ships. The Regia Aeronautica was able to support the Italian Navy from land and over what they called Mare Nostrum, or Our Sea. The Navy concentrated on building large numbers of fast and graceful warships. Because of their speed, they could reach any point on the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea within 24 hours. By the late 1930s, the Regia Marina had six battleships and numerous heavy cruisers and other warships. It was now both larger and more modern than its main rival in the Mediterranean, the French fleet based at Toulon. From there, the French controlled the western Mediterranean, while the bases of her ally Britain at Gibraltar, Malta, and Alexandria dominated access to the Atlantic and the sea lanes to the Suez Canal and the Far East. But the Italian high command was not worried by this. The Mediterranean was Mare Nostrum, in which their powerful fleet could be just as big a threat to Britain and France by remaining in its home ports as by aggressive patrolling of the high seas. However, this attitude also encouraged many Italian naval commanders to adopt a defensive mentality just as war was approaching. When World War II broke out in September 1939, there were only four British capital ships in the whole Mediterranean, too few to mount offensive operations. The Italians were safe, for now. The British were not too concerned, since most of the countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea were either allies, like France and Egypt, or neutral, like Spain and Italy. Several capital ships were sent back to home waters to defend Britain and its sea lanes. Two carriers were kept in the Mediterranean to provide air cover for the shipping which continued safely into 1940. It was the calm before the storm. At the outbreak of World War II, the Royal Navy possessed seven aircraft carriers more than any other country. But in other respects, its lead in naval aviation had declined. Since the First World War, all military aircraft had been placed under the control of the Royal Air Force. And for 20 years, support for the Navy had received little attention. In 1939, the Royal Navy took back control of carrier-borne aircraft, but had only 200 aircraft at sea. Meanwhile, the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps had 2,000 planes for maritime support. Furthermore, the American designs were far more advanced, with all metal monoplanes acting specifically as dive or torpedo bombers. The main British torpedo bomber was the Ferry Swordfish biplane, which entered service in 1936. The fabric-covered swordfish, known as the string bag, was considered antiquated by World War II, but it still proved lethally effective. Powered by a 750 horsepower Pegasus engine, it had a top speed of 150 miles per hour and a comfortable cruising speed of just over 100 miles per hour to a range of 500 miles when fully armed. For want of other aircraft types, the Swordfish had many roles, but was primarily a torpedo bomber carrying a 1,600-pound, 18-inch torpedo. Underwing racks carried up to six 250-pound bombs and eight flares. The biplane configuration of the Swordfish made it highly maneuverable and allowed a low approach speed, which was ideal for landing on the restricted area of a carrier flight deck.
The naval war began badly for Britain. One carrier, HMS Courageous, was torpedoed within days of the outbreak. A second, HMS Glorious, was destroyed by the guns of the German pocket battleships Scharnhorst and Neisenau during the Battle for Norway in 1940. The battleship still appeared to reign supreme at sea. In the following month, France was attacked and in June sought an armistice with Germany. During the last days of the campaign, Mussolini declared war on France and Britain in the hope of gaining some easy pickings for the Italian Empire. There was now every likelihood that the French fleet would fall into German hands. Within a matter of weeks, the whole balance of power in the Mediterranean had tilted to the Axis partners. The British had to eliminate the French fleets at Toulon and Mirz el Kabir in Algeria. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill took what he described as a hateful decision, the most unnatural and painful in which I have ever been involved. He demanded that the French fleet surrender or face destruction. On July 3, 1940, the Royal Navy's Force H, under the command of Vice Admiral Sir James Somerville, arrived off the port of Mirs el Kabir. The French ignored his demands to surrender, so the British opened fire. Much of the French fleet, including three battleships, was sunk at its moorings. Twelve hundred and fifty Frenchmen died in the onslaught. Foolishly, the French announced that the modern battle cruiser Dunkirk had escaped destruction. So two days later, the carrier HMS Ark Royal returned, and her swordfish aircraft swiftly completed the job. It was the first time that a capital warship had been disabled at its moorings inside a harbor by a torpedo bomber. The Royal Navy did not forget the significance of the sinking of the Dunkirk. The following day, July 7th, a British submarine spotted a powerful Italian naval force escorting a convoy to Libya in North Africa. The Commander-in-Chief of the Royal Navy in the Mediterranean, Admiral Sir Andrew Brown Cunningham, or ABC as he was better known, immediately set to sea in his flagship, HMS Warspite. With him were the venerable World War I battleships HMS Ramillies and HMS Malaya, as well as the aging aircraft carrier HMS Eagle. On July 9th, as the Italian fleet was returning to its home port of Taranto, it was intercepted off the coast of Calabria at Cape Spartivento. The British opened fire at long range, and HMS Warspite struck the Italian battleship Giulio Cesare from a distance of 26,000 yards in a display of remarkable gunnery. The Italian fleet turned and fled behind a smokescreen toward Taranto. The Royal Navy pursued it, but soon came within range of Italian land-based bombers which proceeded to bomb both fleets. The cruiser HMS Gloucester suffered a direct hit on the bridge, which caused many casualties, but overall the Italian air attacks were surprisingly ineffective. The Italian Navy complained bitterly about the Air Force's performance. 